It's time for us to begin this morning. I want to welcome you all here today. Uh, especially, uh, of course, we want to always give a special welcome and to our visitors. We're so very glad that you've chosen to be with us. And uh, we welcome everyone that is joining us this morning. I know there are many still joining us on Facebook Live. And, uh, or we'll be watching this uh, this afternoon on YouTube. And we're so glad that you're all with us also today. Before we uh, get into our worship service, I wanted to share something with you all. Of course, you, I think you all received um, uh, emails the last several days about the work that we are involved with in helping with the hurricane relief. Um, both, we, we collected supplies and took them down to, to the Mammal High School FFA and they were taking those supplies to uh, Louisiana. But also, work that we're doing uh, it, with a special contribution. Uh, one check has already been sent by the church, and then others will be collected today and into next week. Um, that is going to help a work called Disaster Assistance Church of Christ. This is a work that Mike Baumgartner, a great brother in Christ, started a number of years ago. Um, we first got to know Mike back in Hurricane Ike which I can't imagine that it's been so, but it's been 12 years ago. Uh, we took a group down to Galveston and we helped Mike. And at that time, his, his work was very small. I mean, he was just working out of an old RV. And through the years, uh, Mike has dedicated himself now. Uh, not long after that, he began full-time in this ministry in which he goes all over the country, not just on the Gulf Coast, not just for hurricanes, but wherever there is a need, wildfires and tornadoes and, and whatever it might be, he goes wherever there's a need and sets up. He's got a number more trailers now where they're able to help a lot more people. But the funds that we're sending are going to uh, that ministry. That ministry is overseen by the elders at the Lake Jackson Church of Christ, right close to us here. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I took some of uh, Mike's pictures off of his Facebook page but I wanted to just kind of get a sense of what they're doing. So I'm going to share these with you now. And you can see that um, they have items that people can come in and get that they need, much like we did after um, Hurricane Harvey in our fellowship hall. Um, in fact, during Hurricane Harvey, Mike was helping us almost every day. I was making trips over to League City where he was set up, and they were giving us supplies, and we were bringing them back to Alvin and handing those out. And we were taking uh, lunches out to various places that, where people had been devastated by the hurricane. Um, but there, there's just a lot of supplies that are brought in. Uh, people come by every day and get food. People who can't cook, they don't have electricity, their houses have been destroyed, they're, maybe they're staying with someone else, but they come by every day and he provides a, a good meal and then they provide other, other food along the way. You can see now, I don't think they even had this uh, three years ago, but now they have these huge cookers. And um, just Friday, uh, Mike reported that they served 6,950 meals in one day. So there, is a, there are a lot of people who were devastated, um, particularly in southeast Louisiana, places like Sulphur, Cameron. But if you haven't seen the pictures out of Lake Charles, they're just places that are completely flattened. And so they are get, they're, they're preparing the meals at the Ninth and Elm Church of Christ in Orange, and then those meals are being taken hundreds of miles into uh, Louisiana every day. Um, you can see here how they're, they're making very large, large batches, uh, commercial type batches of food. Um, and they have uh, Helpers, I'll come back to that one in a minute. They have helpers that are coming in every day from all over uh, the nation uh, to help them do this. Um, but it's just a, a very good work. It's a work that we're very, very familiar with. And we have actually received so much from Mike Bob Gardner's work. So I'm glad that we can be a partner uh, with him. And uh, you probably noticed there's a box on the big table that says special contribution in hurricane relief so if you if you haven't yet if you want to uh, give towards this that money will be sent on uh, this week uh, to add to what we have already sent uh, as a congregation 
Now, I also wanted to show you, this is not everything. This was for the first day. Um, I think this would have been last Wednesday that a lot came in on last Wednesday. Uh, we found out that uh, Benjamin Mooney, who is the president of the FFA in Mantle, his, his organization was collecting items, and they, they I, I thought it was an 18 wheeler. It was our call, actually a very large uh, horse trailer, but they filled it up, and then another trailer too, and they took all these things uh, to uh, the folks that needed them most there in Louisiana. So I just wanted to let you know about all that, and uh, we appreciate everyone who has helped in, in both of those uh, uh, in both of those works to uh, help people. We've all been there, right? We've been on the end of people who who have received the great damage from the hurricane, and so it's always great to be able to help our our, our fellow neighbors. So I just want to let you know about that. Brother Richie's going to come now and begin us in worship. Good morning. Number 886. Number 886. If you stamp this on the prayer to follow, number 886. On a short and stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land. Where my possessions lie, we will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Lord, sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Oh, the transporting rapture scene that rises. Thy God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy 
Commercial is number 927. Number 927. This will have to be the last one. Have you marked that? Please turn number, number 449. Number 449. It's on the four bus this morning. Four point nine. Before I get into my message this morning, I, I didn't have an opportunity to ask them if this would be okay, but I have to let everybody know that Mark and Jan Antley are with us today. We're so glad you are here. Uh, Mark and Jan and their daughter Tony and Faith and Faith's boyfriend James and Jan's mother Lynn were all baptized in Christ. Is it been about a month ago now? I kind of lost track of time. Something like that. And uh, so we're glad. Uh, uh, they haven't been out much um, during this time of the COVID virus. Uh, Lynn um, has uh, Parkinson's disease and she lives with them, and so they're taking good care of her. And, but we're so glad y'all be with us today. Now, and I told them a moment ago, under normal circumstances, everybody would be shaking their hands and hugging them. Of course, we're still in the time of COVID, but I know everyone will want to say hello and welcome uh, Mark and Jan with us this morning. Now, as I actually begin my message, I want you to get an image in your mind. And here's the image. What is the most powerful thing, the most powerful thing that you have ever seen in your life? Now, you might not have seen it live. Maybe you've seen it on you know, television or a movie or whatever. But what, when you think of the word powerful, what comes to your mind? Now, I realize you can't all give your answers. But I have some, some things. I, obviously, right now, our minds are focused on hurricane season, right? We've all experienced the incredible power of hurricanes. We're keenly aware of that now because we're helping our friends over in southeast Louisiana to got the storm that we could have gotten. And it just, do you know, without me showing pictures of the destruction, you know how powerful and of course, uh, the tornadoes that can come off of hurricanes and the tornadoes in the springtime. You know, for a smaller area, for a shorter time, they're even more powerful, right? But, but I also think of, I've always been, I just thought it was amazing how they can implode a building in a downtown area and not affect anything else. But think about the power of that dynamite. They put it in particular places where it will bring the structure. It'd be, be more effective if you could see the video of this, obviously. You've seen it, though, how it just falls straight down. And it's amazing. But there's a lot of power involved with that. I, I was also thinking about, you know, of course, we've, we've not witnessed it ourselves live. But you've all seen uh, pictures or videos of the explosion of a, a nuclear bomb. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. But 
what I, what I most think of when I think of immense power, explosive power, is the Saturn V rocket. The rocket that took us to the moon. What an amazing thing it is. It still amazes me. That Saturn V rocket, and I may get some of this wrong, Jeff, and Jeff can correct me later, but that Saturn V rocket, I looked it up, it weighed 6.2 million pounds. I, 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 I watched the, you know, I watched these live on TV and the launches, and I still came away thinking, how could they get that rocket into the air and into the atmosphere and out of the atmosphere? This, this was incredible, a, a marvel, of, of just a technological marvel. But the power, and, and you've even seen videos even closer to the launch pad, not sure how they do that, of the immense explosive power at that moment. But friends, as powerful as all these things are, and whatever you're thinking about is, there is something in our world that is immeasurably more powerful than all these things together and anything else you can think of. And what I'm talking about this morning is the holy, almighty word of an almighty God. The word of God is immeasurably powerful than anything that we can think of in this world. Nothing else even comes close. There are, of course, many scriptures which describe the omnipotent, all-power nature of God's Word. Both His spoken Word and His written Word that was inspired. The Holy Spirit inspired men to write down the Word of God. Every word, the Word of God. But I think, first of all, from the very beginning of the Bible, you know how Genesis begins. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Look in verse, in verse 11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be light to the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons for days and years. And let them be light to the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And I don't know how, but I left the last five words off. And it was so. And we see this pattern repeated again and again on all six days of created creation. God said it, and it was so. You know, the Holy Spirit could have inspired Moses simply to write, and God made the light, and God made the sun and the moon, and God made the vegetation, and God made man, and all of these things. He could have said it that way, but in fact, Moses was inspired to write, and God said his word. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the Hebrew, the text literally means, if we, if we read it literally from the text, the text literally reads, let there be light, and light was by his word. God's word from the very beginning of time was the power to create all that there is. Matter, energy, time, space. There's nothing that it cannot accomplish. The word of God. God speaking through his prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 58 verses 8 through 11 describes the power of his own word to accomplish whatever he desires. God says my word will do this absolutely and you can depend on it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to be empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and all, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Yes, God's Word will do exactly what God says it will do. And we can depend on that, friends. 
In this day and age in which truth is in constant flux, at least that's what we're being told. There is no absolute truth. Truth is whatever your truth is. Of course we know that's not right. And in fact, we can depend even today in 2020 when the world is saying everything goes. We can depend that the truth of the word of God will accomplish his eternal will in our lives. Friends, we can depend on that. There's not a lot in our world we can depend on. We can depend on the word of God. We can be absolutely certain of God's Word. Now, about this time, some of you will be thinking, okay, Rayford, this is all true. But you're kind of speaking to the choir this morning, aren't you? I mean, we're here, right? We believe in the Word of God. We believe that the Bible, God's holy Word written down, is the inerrant, perfect Word of God, and it is as powerful as you say it is. I think you all believe. Here's the problem, friends. It is that powerful when it is put to use. That is when it enters the hearts and the minds of men and women and is put into practice. It is all powerful. But when it's left unused on a shelf in our home or a book rack in our building, it's powerless to do anything. What did that preacher just say? Oh, surely Rayford just misspoke. How can the Word of God be all powerful and yet powerless at the same time? Well, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that in just a minute. This brings me to our text this morning, our sermon text which describes in such a vivid way the powerful nature, the awesome power of God's holy word. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I invite you to turn there with me. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Here we have the awful, think about this, friends. Here we have the almighty and all-powerful word of God describing the almighty, all-powerful nature of this word. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of merit, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This morning, I want to suggest to you several critical characteristics of God's holy word that are defined by the Hebrew writer in this one little text. And first of all, he tells us the word of God is living. God's word is alive. It's as alive today as it was when the last words were written down by the Apostle John. Near the end of the first century A.D., the Word of God is living. The Word of God is everything to us who are His children. It is our strength and weakness, our guide, and our roadmap through life. In the Word of God, we find the answers to life's most difficult questions. And the powerful words that we find in the Word of God that give us encouragement when we need it, even when we don't know we need it, the Word of God encourages us. Where we do not have specific commands, God's Word provides very clear patterns for us to follow in making the most important decisions of life because the Word of God is living today in 2020. The Word of God, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, has given us everything we need for life and godliness. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
God's divine power has granted us all these things through the knowledge of himself. All of the knowledge, friends, that we have. All that we have from God is found in his holy word. Everything. Now, I know we can see God. We can see his fingerprints all around us. But everything that we know about him and everything that he wants us to know, that knowledge is found in only one place. Men can write commentaries, and I've read some good commentaries about the word of God. But friends, the word of God is the only place that we can find the knowledge in which we can connect with his divine power and have everything that we need for life and godliness. All of that knowledge is made available to us by God through his holy word. So it won't surprise you to say surprise you for me to say this. You've heard this before, you've heard me say it. But year after year, the Bible is the number one bestseller. Year after year, no other book comes close. God's Word is just as pertinent and relatable to life today as it was in every age that its various sections were revealed to mankind. Remember, it was written by different men in different places over several thousand years, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But it's just as relatable to life today as it was when it was in. Think about this, friends. I'm talking to the older folks now. Think about your old textbooks. Do you still have any of your college textbooks around? I don't know why, but for a long, long time, I kept a, a, a textbook from freshman history. It was called The American Experience. And I guess I kept it around because I was so surprised that I made an A in that class. So that was kind of a badge of honor, right? It was a big old thick book. Think about any any books that you studied in college, it's all out of date, right? It's way out of date. That, that, I don't even know what president, I, I can't remember, maybe Jimmy Carter was still president then. There's a lot of history that's taken place in that time since, right? And so those books get out of date. They're dated in such a short time, but the Bible is just as relevant today as it was, again, when the Holy Spirit inspired men to write it down thousands of years ago over a period of thousands of, thousands of years. It is timeless. Now, I know I already asked you a question. What do you think of when you hear powerful? Look, what, what things to you are timeless? Do you think of anything? I don't know if any of these things will be timeless to you, but these are things I thought of. Beautiful sunset, right? There are thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures of a beautiful sunset. Richie's taken some of them. I'm sorry, Richie, I should have taken one of your sunsets. But we would look at that and say, oh, that's timeless, right? How about this? Now, this won't be timeless to all of you. But this car is timeless to my wife. This is a 1963 split window roof Corvette. It's timeless to her, even though it was built so many years ago. Or we think of great literature, Shakespeare, maybe Jen Austin. We think, oh, these things are timeless. Oh, not compared with the Word of God. The Word of God is truly timeless. There's nothing more timeless than the living, everlasting Word of God. It's incomparable. I know I'm using a lot of adjectives, but they're all true, aren't they? Timeless, relative, relatable, incomparable. That's what the Word of God is. There's a great children's song we sing in Vacation Bible School. Our kids that are here, you, you know this song and these words. It goes like this, God's not dead, he's alive. God's not dead, he is alive. I feel him in my hands, I feel him in my feet. There's all kinds of movements you can do with the song. I feel him in my heart, I feel him in my soul, I feel him all over me. I like that song. Because God is alive. 
And his precious holy word is alive. It is living. And we should repeat that over and over again and describe it. Many voices in our world would have us believe the Bible is a dead doctrine. I mean, they come right out and say it, friends. Now, or they say that it's out of touch, it's backwards. And of course, we're backwards because we believe it. But in fact, they are very wrong. The Almighty Word of God is very much alive and fresh and life-giving in this year of 2020. And it's a time, friends, I think you would all agree with me, that it is needed more than ever before. People need to hear the Word of God. We need to spend much more time than we ever have studying and feeding on the Word of God. Peter describes this about the Word of God in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. Since you have been born again, he's talking to Christians, right? Not a perishable seed, but an imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. We were born again through the Word of God. We're born again when we're baptized into Christ, yes. But how do we know that we need to be baptized into Christ? It's because of the Word of God. It takes us to life. It leads people to life in God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower, flower fails. The Word of God remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The word of God is living and it remains forever. It is never ending. The second this morning, the Hebrew writer states, the word of God is active. It is alive and it is active. In every century, in every culture, in every language that the Bible has been read and studied and meditated upon, it has been profoundly affected. Profoundly affected in changing people's hearts, in changing their lives, in turning them toward a relationship with God. In the first century, Gentile pagan world of idolatry, the gospel that was preached by the apostles, the word of God that was preached, changed everything in that world. It turned it from paganism to Christianity. The Greek word that the Hebrew, Hebrews writer uses in our text that translates as active is the same word that we get the word energy from. Think about that. It means operative and powerful, effectual. It comes from the verb in, E-N, which is to move or to put into motion. The Word of God is moving in people's lives, even today. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes, and we also thank God constantly for this, that is their walk with Christ, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. The Word of God is at work, friends. When Christians are abiding in the Word of God, it is at work. It is actively involved in our lives. The Thessalonians were convicted that the Word they were being taught was not in but from God and that that word had energy in them it was at work because the word of God is active and it works in those who have placed their trust in it and they can see this all around them that's what Paul is writing about so what does the living active word of God do for believers for those who not only believe that it is God's word but are abiding by that word it guides us. It inspires us. It chastises us when we need to be chastised. It disciplines us when we need to be disciplined. It encourages us. It challenges us. It empowers us. It motivates us to desire to serve God with all of our might. It is active. The Word of God, as it is received into the mind and heart 
of men and women actively works, the Hebrew writer states in Hebrews 4.12 in our text. Notice what it does. Piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. But friends, see, it only does that when we take the Word of God into our hearts and minds. That Word is able and active in penetrating the complex nature of man, of inner man. It is active in convicting men and women of sin, of exposing hidden motives, and it is able to judge the very nature of life itself. That is the power of the Word of God. It's incredible. To emphasize the power of the Word in changing hearts and lives, the writer also uses a vivid picture here. Now it's going to speak more vividly to that first century audience. But the, what he uses to get his point across is, is the Roman broadsword. He says it is sharper, the Word of God is, than any two-edged sword. And he's talking about this sword right here. Now this is an artist rendition of it. It's not an actual sword, but it is the Roman gladius. Rome conquered the world with this sword. And you notice it's double-sided. It wasn't dull on one side. It was it cut both ways, we might say. Yes, the Word of God, the Hebrew writer says, is sharper than this. It can do much more than this. To a first century audience, this was the very definition of power and strength. And you see the Hebrew writer claims that the Word of God is more capable of this sword in affecting and changing people than that sword was in defeating them. <laughs> Friends, I told you I was going to come back to that crazy statement I made earlier. I'm going to get there in a second. I got ahead of myself again. The Bible is not just able to change hearts and lives of those separated from God, but of course it actively works in the lives of God's people. It works in our lives. That's why Peter charges in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 to Christians, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation. Long for it. Pray that milk just like a newborn baby. In Paul writing, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, emphasizes the continuous active work of the Scripture in the lives of Christians. All Scripture is breathed by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's what the Word of God does. It equips us for every good work of service to our King. Yes, friends, the Word of God is powerful beyond anything your words can describe. It is powerful in changing lives. It is powerful in sustaining spiritual life. But now I got back to where I started. I made this statement early on, which at the time may have seemed counterproductive to my message. Here's the problem. The Word of God is all-powerful just as it claims to be. It is all powerful when it is put into use. But when it is left unused on a shelf or in the book rack in our building, it is powerless to do anything. Friends, the Word of God will only be as powerful as it can be when we are actively feeding on that Word, when we are studying it, when we're meditating on it, and then when we're living it, being doers of the Word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. As James writes in James 1.22, Yes, the powerful Word of God can do anything and everything that God says. But it must be heard in order to change people's lives. Now, I'm not letting people off the hook that haven't heard the Word of God, but friends, we have the Word of God. We have it. We claim that it is all-powerful. 
We claim that it will change people's lives. But what are we doing with the Word of God? That's my question this morning. We're not pursuing it for ourselves. If we're not spending much time reading it, studying it, meditating it, is it really doing all that it can do for us? And when we're not sharing it with other people, what power does it have to change their lives? We've got to have the courage, the wherewithal, the trust in God to step out of our comfort zone and share His Word. Trusting that it has the power. Believing that the Gospel, as Paul writes in Romans 1.16, is the power of God for salvation. And if I believe that, that means I believe that unless people hear the gospel, they're not going to be saved. We're the vessels. God has placed his holy word into our hands. Into our hands the gospel is given. I love that old song. Into our hands is given the light. And let us carry God's precious message, guiding the airing back to the light. Oh, friends, there's nothing more powerful than the Word of God. My question to you this morning, is it having the power in your life that it ought to? How completely involved in your life is the Word of God? Friends, it ought to be woven into everyday life. That's how important it is. And that's the power that it needs to have in all of our lives. And I just challenge all of us, including myself. You know, with all the study I do, I don't spend enough time just sitting down with God and reading His Word. But I trust in the power, I know you trust in the power of God's Word, that it can do everything it says it will do. Now let's take it and use it. There's a reason that Paul calls it the sword of the Spirit. There's that two-edged sword again. Same sword. Same sword. That the Hebrews writer talks about. It is powerful beyond anything we can imagine. It may be that you don't know that power in your life because you have not yet, perhaps you've not studied the gospel. Perhaps no one has taught you the gospel. Maybe you're out there, maybe you're here in this audience or out there on the internet and, and you need to, to talk to somebody about your spiritual life and you need to, to find out how do I how do I connect with the power of the gospel in order to be saved? We'd be glad to share that with you, friends, and to share with you the power of God's word to save and to enable us to live the way God wants us to live. And so if you're out there on the Internet and you need to talk to somebody, please call me this morning after service, 281-701-7847. And I want to share the gospel with you. I want to talk to you about this powerful word. I'm holding your hand. Friends, if we can help you in any way this morning, won't you please come? I just don't know what we said. Why keep Jesus waiting? <coughs> waiting in the cold.
Scripture number, <coughs> number 382, number 382. First time before we'll start with this morning. Number 382. so much for your son, who gave us an example to follow, and above all, love is enough to die on the cross for our sins, and to take this bread that represents his body that was broken for us, and we look to the cross and take it in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, Father, we thank you for your son, the bloody shell on the cross, to wash away our sins so we get to have a home with you in heaven. May we reflect back to the cross and the sacrifice he made and the love he had to do so. And above all, the love you had to give your son for our sin. May we drink this cup in the matter of pleasing you. In Jesus' name we pray.
this time we'll say a prayer for the blessing that God has blessed us with to get back appropriately. Dear God, we thank you so much for the many blessings you've blessed upon us, and we ask that you continue to bless us and watch over us, and especially be with those who are sick and need your healing hand. We ask that you uh, take the gifts that we give back to you, that it will be used to further your word and to help others, and may it be used appropriately and as desired. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We're so thankful that we're your children. That you give us the word, your word. We're thankful that you sent God, uh, Christ, to lead an example for us to live by. We're thankful that you left a written word and for the man that you have when we were appointed as elders and preachers and deacons. We're thankful for all these things, and you bless us so. Forgive us our sins, and it's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.